Well, thank you, Andrew, for having me. Uh, my name is Carrie Graham. I'm an attorney out in Katy, Texas, and a predominant part of my practice is estate planning and probate and guardianship, and then uh, the lit litigation of those issues. I've got um, some things here listed that I do. I also do a lot of crossover work with family law, so divorce and modification, uh, child support, things like that. Um, love getting to come and chat here. Um, today, Andrew asked me to talk a little bit about um, estate planning. I always like to include my contact information so that if you have a question that's very specific to a situation you're dealing with, or if you're looking for something I referenced in this uh, chat, then I want you to be able to reach out and ask um, for those things. So my phone number is here. My email is here. I'm not a great emailer. So if you are listening, I'm going to give you my cell number so you can write it down. It's 832-567-1349. So you can email me, but if you do shoot me a text, let me know it's there and I'd be happy to respond and get back to you. I'm kind of doing a little bit on um, estate planning basics today. I think that sometimes there's two different perspectives from folks that can be a little bit frustrating uh, for attorneys. And that's that, you know, we're an expensive purchase. We know that. And um, we know that when we are uh, dealing with people and the way they spend their money, we're not always a fun way to do it. And so people get hesitant. And yet they also really don't recognize the importance and it really the substantial cost that can come without having these proper things done. And so I want to give some information on that today. I think that estate planning is important because advanced planning, especially when we're not in our advanced years, um, avoids crisis and it avoids litigation. It's pretty hard to argue that you were incapacitated in your 40s or your 50s unless you have some sort of underlying health condition. But once we get older, the human nature in us uh, tends to want to think that maybe with advanced age comes advanced mental decline. And that's not true. But it is an argument that's commonly made and the older we are, the harder it is to combat that. I think it also helps families really understand what our wishes are and helps us to have good conversations. Um, a very odd thing that I do with my adult children each year is I pretend to die and I ask them like, now, what do you do? Do you know where to go? Do you know where my passwords are? I have a black death box. They don't think I'm funny at all, by the way. Um, none of this is humorous. And then I give them expensive wine and steak at the end of this as a thank you for, for playing along. But for my peace of mind, I want them to know what I want. Do I want to be cremated? Do I, you know, do I have any preferences regarding end of life or kept alive on machines? There are things I care that they know. And so it gives us these documents, give us a tool for those conversations that saves a lot of crisis down the road. Um, but it also, besides giving us the ease for the future, helps us to avoid statutory distributions which may not be what we want at all, especially if we're in a blended family or we have a, you know, if you're a child and your parent gets married later in life, that person's going to have some serious rights. And we want to make sure that we're not dealing with that in a crisis situation. I see a lot of times where people can't pay for nursing home care. They can't sell the house and they've got a squatter spouse who maybe doesn't even really want to stay there, but they get to do it for free. And so it can really cause a lot of angst when we're dealing with real life crisis that we could have avoided by some basic estate planning. When we go through uh, today, I'd like to start with a little bit of um, just some basic definitions, understanding what some of these basic documents are. So the first one is a will. I'll say that's what drives most people to my office and probably one of the, I would say, lesser important documents in some respects. But a will is a, a document that is going to distribute your things when you die. And a will works regardless of the size of your estate. It even works if you're taxable. Now, it's not ideal because you can avoid taxation with other documents, but it's a very helpful document in appointing someone to administer and manage your estate. And then also pretty seamless in Texas, you know, pretty quick, 60 days, $3,000. I mean, we're pretty reasonable getting in and out. So reasonably um, easy and cheap, but I always kind of joke that that's the reason people come in and it's probably one of the lesser important things I do because once we're gone, right? There's, we're not worried about our stuff anymore. We're not here, but while we're alive, having people appointed as a decision maker under a medical power of attorney or a durable power of attorney to manage our finances, that affects our livelihood. Can we afford to pay for a nursing home care? Does someone know what we want? I, 
I don't ever want to be put on a CPAP machine. I think they're awful, but I would be unless someone knew that because that's what a doctor is going to recommend. And so these documents really control our quality of life and they control our ability to put decision makers in place and they become super important. Um, an advanced directive is our ability to tell, to tell our physician, our family, our friends, what we want if we have an irreversible or, um, or a very serious condition that requires decision making. And then last is a HIPAA release. I love these, I think they're critical. This is a document that gives permission to specific lists of people who can receive your medical information. Why is that good? Because if you've got a kid in the military and out of state child, if you've got someone who can't communicate well with the family, so they're not a decision maker, but you want them informed, it allows them to call and get access at their convenience as to how you're doing. So it becomes really um, a very helpful document. So who needs estate planning? Well, I get the call all the time. I just want a basic, basic will, basic plan. And what they're really trying to tell me is they don't want to spend a bunch of money. I get it, absolutely. And estate planning should be reasonably affordable. But a, people get a little bit confused about estate and in their minds, they think, wow, I really, I need to be very wealthy in order to have an estate. And that's not true. If you have a lease, if you have an electricity plan, if you're contractually obligated in any way to a credit card, to a mortgage, you have an estate. If you have bank accounts, you have an estate. And so most people have an estate. It's very uncommon that someone would not have an estate. But there are some situations where we wanna make sure we have plans. The first is marriage. If you get remarried or you get newly married and you have separate property, you may not like the law and what it does with your property in the event that you die. For example, if you are in a blended family, so if I'm married to a man and he has kids and I have kids, if he dies and he has minor children, his kids own half my house, which means that I'm probably dealing with his ex, which may not be the most awesome of situations. And so that can be real sticky, real sticky for people. Um, if you get a divorce, right? One interesting thing is uh, now if you file for divorce, you're not allowed to change your will. And so all of the divorces I file, the first thing we do is write a will. We do the will, we wait a day, we file the divorce because we want to be maintain the right to choose who gets our things, especially when a divorce is pending. But if you get a divorce, you need to revisit your estate plan. If you're expecting a child or you have minor children, right? We wanna make sure that our minor children um, have documents at their school that says if something happens to their dad and I, this is who you can release my children to. A lot of people don't know this, but CPS actually has to get involved and vet your family before they can just send your kids there. And so it's really important to have those documents, um, not just at home, but also on file with the school or daycare. And then for parents, you can determine in that document um, who would get your children. And if there's any type of dollar attached to your children, people sometimes fight. And so having these documents, we really honor them in Texas and they're a very important part of our estate plan. Next, we talked a little bit about the blended family. A lot of people want to have a blended family, but especially widowed spouses, they may really feel strongly about my former wife, former husband who died. I want their stuff to go to my kids, not to my spouse. We need to talk about what happens to the house. What if one of you gets sick? What if we need to sell it? What are we going to do should those unexpected yet sort of kind of expected situations occur and because people are confused about what happens and they think well if I bought this house right um, or I live with my spouse surely I have rights well you do but a lot of times the kids who are out here waiting don't realize they're actually in charge of paying the taxes and the insurance and things on that house um, while the surviving spouse is still living there and so it's not fun to have to pay for a place you can't sell and can't use. We are in Texas, a community property state. And so when we look at what happens to a home after you die, we have to know that even if you have community property, so I have separate property, my spouse is gonna have a homestead right to that home to live there. But even if I'm a co-owner, it's community property, we bought it during our marriage. Like I said, I'm gonna own that with those kids. And then what? They're gonna want their money. Am I gonna be able to buy them out? How does that really work on the practical side? Well, most of the time it doesn't, and then you end up spending more money on lawyers and you could have just had a good plan. And that's not a very exciting way to do it. The other thing that gets really sticky is that 
if I have a husband who has children and they're little, his ex-wife has priority standing to manage the kids' assets. So I can't get away from her. And I mean, I'm probably not going on too much of a branch if I tell you that that's not usually my best friend. And so it gets really uncomfortable. And then of course you've got little people in the middle of it and that's even worse. Um, here's just a little bit of information on special needs trusts. So when you have a child who has special needs, especially when they are below the age of 18, um, any asset they receive, um, whether it's childhood or adult, is going to dollar for dollar diminish their SSI benefits and it's gonna completely disqualify them from Medicaid insurance if they are um, getting over $2,000, which is almost always the case. So one thing I like to do in my wills is we always have a contingent special needs trust that says, hey, in the event someone's special needs, we wanna make sure we're planning for that. And that's gonna be super important. And then if they already have a known special needs adult or child, we wanna talk about the importance of having a standalone special needs trust because the only person who can create that is a parent, a grandparent, or a court. Obviously, a court is going to be a much more expensive way to go. So if you're looking at documents at home and you want to think about some things that um, are kind of what I would call will fails, um, here's some things that we want to make sure we're looking for. Common things I see is that the will will fail to make an executor and the alternate executors independent. So in the event that you do not state in your will specifically that the court should not supervise or actually use the word independent executor, you have to get all of the beneficiaries to agree that you can serve independently. And if you have kids under 18, that's not going to be possible. So now what happens is we have a dependent administration. And the difference is that in an independent administration, we don't have to pay our lawyer to go through the court to ask for permission to sell an asset, to pay a bill. But in a dependent administration, we have to do that. And it's substantially more expensive. I would say three to five times the cost, if not more, even when you get along, because you're constantly paying your lawyer to ask the court for permission to do every single solitary thing, even though the will said you could. The next is, is looking at the will and finding that, they, that there's not a provision to allow the executor to serve without bond. And a lot of people get confused about a bond. So a bond is an insurance policy that you purchase that says if someone steals from my estate, this is where we can go to make a beneficiary whole. Probably more familiar with it in a criminal context. So if someone commits a murder and they have a million dollar bond, they're really not giving up a million dollars. They're buying a million dollar insurance policy. It says if I don't show up in court, you guys can go get this million dollars and use it to hunt me down. Well, in the civil context, what we're doing is ensuring that no one gets harmed by the executor's choices. So if I have a million dollars of cash and I don't give someone their inheritance, that beneficiary can now go to this policy. Well, the problem is that insurance policy, it just costs money. And so when we're dealing with um, expensive things like purchasing a bond for every year that person's in service, it's just one more way we're draining the estate all because we didn't have that oh so very important phrase that says they can serve without bond. Um, the other thing that happens is it's not self proof. So in the event in Texas, when we have a will, we can say that this is a self proof will, which means that we have an affidavit at the back that everybody signs that the, the witnesses that were here, they're over 14, that the testator was over 18 or everybody's of sound mind. If we don't have that affidavit, we have to either get a witness to court or we have to bring in handwriting witnesses that recognize the signature. And each time we're having to do more at the courthouse, we're running up a bill. And so we always want to make sure that we have that self-proving affidavit at the back to avoid those extra costs. Let's talk a little bit. We talked a little bit about married folks, so we don't want to leave out our single folks. I'm a single folk, so I'm speaking to myself. It is super important to make sure that our, our single individuals have decision-making documents. The health and safety code says that there's a priority for who can serve. It starts with your agent under a power of attorney, and then it's your spouse, and then it's your next of kin, and then it's basically anybody who shows up, right, who's there to make decisions, but hospitals don't like it. 
and are not very antsy to make difficult decisions with the decision maker that's not nominated or not specifically named. So in the event someone is single, especially if they're an only child or they don't have a big family, someone who's gonna show up and support them, we wanna make sure they have these decision-making documents so that in the event they can't make their own decisions, someone is gonna be able to do that. And then we wanna make sure they have that HIPAA release so that there's a list of people who love and care about them, who can check on them. Because one thing we know about facilities and hospitals is that the worst care goes to the least visited person. It's just the nature of the beast. Squeaky wheels get the grease. So if someone's showing up for you, someone's there, you're likely to get better care. So what happens if we don't have them? If we don't have these decision-making documents, whether you're married or you're single, the court will allow someone to apply to be your guardian. And the guardianship is a different topic for a different day, but basically you're taking someone's constitutional rights away from them and conferring them on someone else. And the court system is involved every single day for the rest of your life. And so it is really important to make sure we avoid those costly, costly proceedings and these documents absolutely do that. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about the medical power of attorney. So the medical power of attorney is what we call a springing document. That means I'm gonna name my favorite child A, and if they can't or won't, or they die, it goes to my favorite child number two. And if they can't or won't, it goes to, number three, right? They spring to the next person. And these are not very high level documents. You only have to have decisional capacity to sign them. So it's not super high. You have to understand um, what your medical care generally ent entails. And you wanna make sure that they can understand what the consequences of medical decision would be. So even somebody with some you know, moderate dementia or short-term memory loss, they can probably do that in the moment. They can still sign this document pretty low. And there's a presumption that you have capacity until someone says you don't, that has cred credibility to do it, like a court or a physician, like a medical doctor. And so we wanna make sure that in this document, we do not name co-agents. People always think, well, I love both of my children, or these two are so, they get along so well. Think of this document like naming a Tiebreaker. When your kids all get along, no one's even going to look at this document. But when they disagree, who is the hospital or doctor or caregiver to turn to to listen and take that decision from? The next one is our highest level of uh, contractual capacity. This is also a springing document. So your financial power of attorney, you also no co-agents on this one because co-agents are not going to be accepted very often by banks or financial institutions. Now this frustrates people because they feel, uh, clients feel like if you have two people, that's gonna offer you some protection, right? Because there's two people looking at the books, way less arguing, more accountability, and that is not inaccurate. The problem is from the banking side, banks don't wanna have to track down two people. And then who do they really listen to if those powers of attorney, if the agents disagree? So it can be a real problem. And so springing document, or it can be immediate. You can sign a power of attorney that starts today or starts um, in the event someone determines you're incapacitated. And there's no right or wrong to that. A lot of it's just situational and people's comfort. But this is the highest. You have to have contractual capacity. You have to have the mental ability to contract like you are making a purchase. You're signing a promissory note. You have to prove this by circumstantial evidence. So I'll give you an example. I did a will for a guy who was 93 years old and he was an engineer and still working as an engineer. My circumstantial evidence was that he was still working and building buildings that people were gonna let the public get into. He clearly had capacity to sign a power of attorney and a will, right? So you wanna make sure when you're talking to folks, especially if they're older or have a diagnosis, you wanna take some information so that you can say, no, no, I had circumstantial evidence that they really did understand, but always keeping in mind that having dementia is not in and of itself a deterrent, right? So we can have short-term memory loss, but also really in the moment understand. And so it's important to kind of vet clients and make sure when you're working with your elderly parents or other family members that you don't just discount them because they might have a diagnosis, but we also want to be conscientious of the fact, which is why, again, like I said at the beginning, I think doing this in your younger years is important and then updating as needed, right? Especially if you're working with an attorney, I keep everything in Word. 
you're not paying me a bunch of money to update it, but we can do those little updates here and there, and it's very reasonable. So I get a lot of questions about trust, and shouldn't you do them? Aren't they better? And you know, a lot of attorneys love them. I'm not a huge fan. I don't think they're a one size fits all. I think they're fantastic. If you've got special needs kids or out of state property, because you can avoid out of state taxation, I think it's wonderful um, to have a trust. If you have minor children or you want to control your kids when you die, like that's a great way to do it. But for a lot of people, trust just costs more money, you know? And so, so I like to talk with clients about their goal. A big thing that happens with trust that is frustrating to practitioners is two things. First of all, we do them. And then a client either doesn't fund them, like the trust needs to own something in order for it to be a valid trust. Or what happens is they lose the trust document. And now we don't know what the trust says. I had a client create a trust, my client, my client created a trust without me, made me his trustee, never told me, and then he got really sick and then he died. And so I found out when I went to the bank to try to help the kids collect assets and they were like, oh no, you're the trustee of this trust. We never found the trust. We had to use a court proceeding and the court had to order the terms of the trust based on the um, trust code, which was ugh, awful and very expensive. So a lot of things happen with trusts that aren't awesome, but there are a time, there's a time and a place when they're pretty awesome. Oh, and I think that's the end. So I will turn it back over to Andrew at this time. Thanks, y'all.